Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you God's people. Give an honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. I uh, thank God for everything that he has done. Uh, one thing I've learned over my life is that we have to make sure that even in the midst of trouble or problems that we have in our life, to always make sure that we give the Lord thanks. Uh, like Job, we have to give God praise even in the midst of our struggle, even in the midst of loss, no matter what it is. The Lord is always worthy to be praised and to be given glory. Because in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our problems, the Lord is still with us. We still breathe, we still live, we still move, we still have our being. And although at times it may be daunting, at times it may look like um, there's no way out, that, uh, that, that you have to do uh, the one thing that you don't want to do or whatever it is, we have to not lose sight of God and his power and we must keep the faith and not panic and not worry. The song, I will always say this, and I remember this song growing up. It says, if you're going to worry, don't pray. And if you're going to pray, don't worry. We have to make sure that we keep the faith and not worry. Um, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. It is very imperative of all of us to not lose sight. We must understand too that the things of this world are temporary. No matter what it is, car, home, uh, money, uh, clothing, no matter what you have, even my glasses I wear, the jewelry I wear, it does not matter. Everything we have is temporary. It breaks. Sometimes you got to junk it, throw it away. But what matters is what lasts. A relationship with God lasts forever. As long as you're willing to put in the time and put in the effort to build the relationship. And above all, the Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall stand. We must always make sure that despite everything that we have or despite everything that we may attain, that we make sure that the word is our foundation. The Lord didn't call us to be rich. He called us to be his. He's called us from among the wicked so that we may turn around and go back to them and call others from darkness. That is our calling and that is our purpose the Lord knows sometimes I think the Lord does things in order for us uh, to shift our focus a lot of times we think we're focused on the Lord's mission a lot of times we think we're focused on what the Lord has for our lives and then in, in the end we're not and so the Lord has to do certain things some things may be drastic to others or drastic to us but the Lord does those things to kind of Kind of push away the weeds and the trees out of your out of your sight or move the distractions out of your way to show you exactly where you're off. You know, it's like being on a road. Sometimes we, we get to a fork in the road, we thinking we're making we're taking the right path. When that when actuality we've gone the wrong way. And so so sometimes the Lord has to get us to a dead end to have us do a U-turn. To go back up that bad road. And then when you go back up that bad road, you look at all the, the things that happened because of this bad decision. You see, oh, I shouldn't have did this. I shouldn't have did that. The Lord shows you. That's where the learning happens. When you have to go back up. And then after you go back up, back to that fork, the Lord goes, now, go this way. So we must make sure that as God's people, that we make sure that we do not lose sight of him, the mission, and what we're supposed to do as his people. 
and that is to live according to the word but also in order to live according to his word we have to know it and we have to know it and we have to digest it spiritually in our souls so that we can make sure that we do not sin against him amen amen it's an encouragement to all of us because uh, this is a tough time no, no matter what it, this is a tough time for all of us financially emotionally physically there's so much going on right now in this country and in this world and at times it really distracts us from God we're so focused looking at this that we're not looking to, to him and we must make sure that our focus is on him Amen. God bless you. May the Lord keep you is our prayer. Uh, I want to do our uh, prayer list this morning. Um, a special prayer. I, I, I name, um, her name is Rosie Mendoza Addington. Um, I want to pray for her. Uh, she's dealing with an esophageal uh, situation. Um, she can't eat anything. All she can do is use liquids. She's had so many surgeries. And so... The only thing I can do uh, as far as that, the only thing I can tell her is to rely on Christ. Don't lose your faith. Although the tunnel is dark, always remember that Jesus is the light. Make sure that as you're going through this dark tunnel to not lose sight of who Christ is. As you're going through this troubled time, don't lose faith because that is the light that will guide you to the end of the tunnel the Lord's going to bring you out the Lord's going to heal you it's, it may take some time but the Lord will heal and if the Lord does not that does not mean we lose our faith it means that we what stay within that because the Lord does things in his own time and he does things in his own will we don't control that. He does. My prayer is that the Lord touches your mind, your body, and your soul, and he heals all three. And I'm praying for you, I'm praying for your family, that the Lord will God not only heal you, but also heal the family. Give them calm and re re release and reduce their stress on all of you. That the Lord will guide you through this and bring you out on the good ear. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for uh, Reverend Mary Adelsberger, uh, Diana Lestani, uh, praying for uh, Harmony Truman. I know she was dealing with some health issues that the Lord will watch over her. Uh, Deacon Tommy and uh, Sister Dorothy Shula and family, uh, David William Cobb and his wife, Anne Marie. I want to pray for them. He's still dealing with uh, the loss of a limb that the Lord would watch over him. Um, there are many others on this prayer list, but I want us to all as God's people to pray for one another that God will, no matter what situation we're in, keep us, watch over us, and above all, that we keep the faith. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your grace Lord God we thank you for all that you have done from the smallest to the biggest realizing Lord God that the things that we miss and uh, consider as significant are the things that, that are most important for you allow us to rise you allow us to breathe you allow us Lord God to see to feel you allow us to do things Lord God and we just want to say thank you whether we're in a wheelchair, whether we're not, whether we're blind, whether we can't hear. Anything that you allow us to do, Lord God, is still a blessing. And we just want to say thank you. We ask you, Lord God, for the names on the prayer list, all that I cannot read at once, Lord God, but all the names that are on the list. But actually, Lord God, I'm asking for special prayer uh, for uh, Miss Mendoza, Lord God, and her family. Uh, Rosie, Lord God, we asking, Lord God, that you would bless them, watch over them, but Lord God, especially her. Lord God, she needs your healing hands to touch her body, 
to touch her esophagus, Lord God. She's had many surgeries and she's getting a little discouraged, Lord God. And it's tough physically, Lord God, emotionally and spiritually. But Lord, I know that you can, Lord God, if it's your holy will, to heal and touch her body, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Touch her esophagus, Lord God. Heal it, Lord God, that she may be able to get off the liquids and that she may be able to be on solid foods. Realizing, Lord God, it's tough. Lord God, it's it's discouraging, Lord God. But we know that you are with her. We know that you're with her family. And we're asking, Lord God, to give them the strength to help give her strength and to help keep her faith strong and that you keep their faith strong. I know at times, Lord God, at times in this world, Lord God, it's hard to believe. It's hard to keep your faith strong. It's hard to deal with things in this life. But Lord, I know that even when it's darkest, that's when you are at your strongest. That's when you are at your best. And I ask you, Lord God, to keep us at our best when it is darkest. Help us, Lord God, not to, to fall, not to trip, but Lord God, to stand. To be able to stand in the darkest at the roughest times. To keep our faith. To keep going. To not stop. Realizing, Lord God, that you will shine a light. That we may be able to order our footsteps according to your word. That, Lord God, that our faith will light the way. And that you will guide us through. In the name of Jesus. Financial times are hard for all, Lord God. And we ask you, Lord God, to touch finances. To touch Lord God, those who are struggling with those things, Lord God, realizing, Lord God, although the economy is rough, although the economy is tough, bills are piling up, you have allowed us still to be able to sustain, to be able to live, to be able, Lord God, to just be able to survive. And we're just asking, Lord God, for a little extra help, for a little extra blessing, Lord God, if it's our holy will. As we go into your word this morning, we ask you, Lord God, to guide my mouth, to guide my heart, to preach your word, Lord God, to give your word, Lord God, that others may be helped, that others may be saved, Lord God, that they may hear, Lord God, and their hearts may be changed, Lord God, that they spiritually may be baptized, that they seek out, Lord God, a godly place where they can be baptized physically. Lord God, these are the blessings I ask your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Our opening scripture this morning uh, will be out of the book of uh, 2 Timothy. The Lord laid this on my heart uh, this morning, and it is fitting for us to know. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 14 through 17. For everyone knows what 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, that a workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But nobody really under, goes into the next chapter. We know the fourth chapter, but the third chapter, in many ways, gets overlooked. So this morning, our opening scripture, before we go into our text, scripture, and word, I want to read this uh, chapter. Uh, that is 2 Timothy, the third chapter, the 14th through the 17th verses, which are very important. Uh, Paul's encouragement to this young pastor named Timothy, who he considers... A son. Verse 14 reads by saying, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, this is very important, all scriptures is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. In other words, without the scripture, we are not complete. And we as God's preachers are not properly equipped to do the work of Christ. Again, I've read for you here in the book of 2 Timothy, the third chapter, the 14th through the 17th verse out of the Christian Standard Bible. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word for the edification of our souls. Uh, this 
afternoon for a little while. Uh, we're going to come out of the Old Testament. Amen. Old Testament, uh, minor prophet out of the book of Amos. The seventh chapter. This is our text for our word this morning, for this afternoon. This is, uh, again, the book of Amos, the seventh chapter. Uh, we're going to 10 through 17. It's uh, the book of Amos, the seventh chapter, the 10th through the 17th verses. But this afternoon, I just want to read uh, 12 through 17. That's again, uh, the seventh chapter, 10 through 17 will be the verses we'll be dealing with in the, in the uh, sermon. But uh, I want to focus on and read 12 through 17. The twelfth verse of that seventh chapter of Amos reads by saying, Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go away, you seer. Flee to the land of Judah. Earn your living and give your prophecies there. But don't ever prophesy at, at Bethel again, for it is the king's sanctuary. Remember that word. It is the king's, key word, king's sanctuary and a royal temple. So Amos answered Amaziah, I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman, and I took care of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. And your land will be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself will die on pagan soil. And Israel will certainly go into exile from its home land. That's out of the Christian Standard Bible. This afternoon, I just want to talk to you uh, from the subject, boldness in the face of adversity. Boldness in the face of adversity. This book of prophecy uh, was written by the prophet Amos. Hmm. Amos, a man whose family raised cattle and farmed sycamore trees was called by God to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria. Amos was not from a family of priests or prophets, but God called him and qualified him to speak his word of warning and judgment to the nation of Israel. Amos was born in the city of Tekoa, about six miles outside of Bethlehem, within the region of Jerusalem in the land of Judah. This shepherd from Tekoa was chosen to preach the message of judgment and redemption to the nation. In other words, he didn't just preach doom, he also preached a way that they can be saved, that they can avoid doom if they only listened. Many theologians believe that Amos' time in the north was short. But yet his message was very effective, despite the opposition from the people. The meaning of the prophet's name is burden. God called him to bear the burden of prophecy to Israel of their judgment. Hmm. Amos prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, King Uzziah in Judah, and King Jeroboam II in Israel. This, this also shows that during Amos' time, Isaiah was alive and then called to prophesy after the death of King Uzziah in Judah. When you study the major and minor prophets, uh, you'll find that many were alive, either young or old, and prophesying around the same times, during the pre-exile during the exile and during the post-exile period of Israel to include Judah. 
to pre the prevailing theme of this book of Amos is God's righteous judgment. For his people had gone astray. Here they were in the land of promise that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now this land, this, this, this nation has fallen on this promised land into idol worship in the temple. And they have completely rejected God altogether. They were prosperous. They had a strong military presence among the nations in that region. But it meant nothing without faith in God. The nation seemed to be going through the motions of worship. But there was no true love or respect for God. Even in the midst of their prosperity, they refused to give God credit and to strengthen their relationship with him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like our nation today. The Lord has blessed this nation to come from the depths of what it was during the 18th century to be able to fight against a principality, a, a ruling country of England, to beat them with the, a small militia of people who volunteered to fight against the tyranny of this nation, of that nation. We, we made it, we were successful, and now here we are now in this future, over 200 years later, and we still have not learned anything. We are finding ourselves falling away from God. We are, we are finding ourselves outright rejecting God. From the time this country was in its inception till now, each generation has slowly but surely walked away from the church, walked away from the principles of the gospel, and basically went off to establish their own thing. What Paul says in, in Romans 10, where he says, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. This nation, our country, has done that. We've established our own brand of righteousness. We have refused to submit ourselves to God because we're so full of our own arrogance. This is what Israel's problem was. This nation has been prosperous. One of the strongest militaries in the world, yet we are the youngest nation. And yet here we are, weakening ourselves because we have walked away from God. So in this text, so when this farmer, a gatherer of sycamore fruit, also a shepherd from Judah, this man, a shepherd and a farmer, when he shows up and preaches a word of judgment and repentance in Bethel, it is obvious that the message will fall on deaf ears. For their arrogance and the false notion that God would not destroy them or take their land away from them seem to fuel their rejection of Amos and the message of God. Hmm. So verses 10 through 11 says, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all thy words or all his words. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive of their own land. In these verses, we see the priest of Bethel. He sends a message to the king about the man of God, Amos. Amos was the chief high priest in the temple in Bethel. Since Israel was up north of Jerusalem, Bethel became the place of worship and sacrifice. But Israel lost Jerusalem when they and Judah split under King Rehoboam. Judah stayed south, keeping Jerusalem and the temple as their central place of worship. Hmm. So this high priest is now reporting or complaining to the king, Jeroboam II, about this farmer prophet. It seems pretty petty for this high priest to go against the man of God and mock him. He was the high priest. Surely he should have recognized 
the man of God through his words, and he should have recognized the path that the nation was treading. But instead, he focused on his appearance and his vocation. In other words, he actually, instead of listening and understanding, he decided to insult. That's what many folks do. When they know they're preaching a lie, when they know they're not telling the truth, when they know they're wrong, instead of repenting, they want to retaliate. Hmm. So Amaziah's position in the temple was an important one because he was appointed the high priest by the king. He was in charge of the religious traditions, the adherence to the laws, and he had the important job of urging the nation into the continual worship of God. So this is a pretty important position. But the problem is he failed miserably. How did he fail, Reverend? How did he fail, Pastor? Just how did he fail? Well, he failed because of the obscene and the adulterous and the lascivious acts he allowed in the temple at Bethel. That was dedicated. Now, this, this temple in Bethel was dedicated to the worship of God Almighty. The nation was infusing the rituals, pagan rituals, and foreign gods in the temple of God along with their worship and sacrifice to God. Remember now, Israel was in Canaan. This is the promised land. There were other nations, idol-worshiping nations around them that Israel and Judah had treaties with, traded with. So instead of staying staunch and staying steadfast in their belief in God, in their the laws of God, they decided to do it their own way, to go and infuse the evil and pagan practices of the people around them. In other words, they decided to fit in instead of being different. Israel was called to be a beacon, a beacon so that the other nations could be saved, that instead they became like the other nations. This sounds like many church leaders today, talking about Amaziah's position. So much evil has infiltrated the church why has it infiltrated the church, Pastor? Well, because church leaders have turned away from God and have decided to lean on their own carnal knowledge. For years, the church has chosen what it wants to be outraged about, but then overlooked the blatant sin right in front of their eyes within the church. We raise sand about uh, this and we, we act a fool about that. You know, we... We, we jump up when there's racial injustice. We, we jump up when there's uh, uh, this thing against this. And we, you know, in political stuff, we want to raise and raise and raise our voices and act a fool. But yet within the church itself, so much mess is going on and we are allowing it. The money changes are in the temple. Hmm? The lascivious behaviors are in the temple. All of the sexual demons and all of these evil things, the drug use, everything evil is in the temple. It is in the church. And yet we see this right in front of our eyes and yet we allow it to happen. Why? Why is this going on in God's house? Hmm. What? Do we have to gain? What do pastors and leaders have to gain with allowing this mess going on? We look at the Lutheran and the Methodist churches and how they're going away from the very tenets of the gospel. How pastors are changing the gospel and saying, well, the, we need to make the gospel modern to how we live, which is false because the word of God is timeless. It is just as good as it was for Paul as it is good for us. Just as it was good for Moses, it is good for us. The word of God does not change. He said so. I change not. I'm the same as I was yesterday, as I am today, and as I will be forever. The word 
does not change. But what do they gain by doing all of this, by allowing these things to happen? What do church leaders have to gain? Well, money, power, and prestige. To be able to fit in. To be able to, to be able to have say so, they think, in this political lunacy. Because I call it political lunacy. Because it has divided us, not only in this world where everybody fight each other just because we are different and we believe different things, but also within the church. If you vote in a certain way, they don't want to talk to you. If you believe a certain thing should happen within this and within that, they hate your guts and they will put you out. This is how petty we have become. This is what happens when we allow Satan in and don't defeat him. This is also what happens when the word of God is not preached properly and not studied. When you have ill-equipped preachers and pastors leading God's people. That's the truth. And Amaziah in this chapter is an example of what a lot of our church leaders are. A lot of, of our church leaders, excuse me, are now. Let's keep going. So when but but so so these pastors, these preachers, and these leaders allow this mess to happen. But when a true man of God comes forward, preaching the truth, without filter. Church leaders like Amaziah mock and try to push the man of God to the side. This is why Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, so they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they should turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What draws the crowds in are words that are close to the truth, but truly are not truth. They want to hear the lie that your life as it is is okay. People want to hear that their sinful life is okay and that they are still assured a place in heaven. Everybody wants to be blessed, but nobody wants to do the work of a Christian in order to be blessed. We want to straddle the fence and play both sides instead of choosing wisely and giving God every part of our being. We want to go to heaven on our, on our human merit, but not through striving for the high calling in Christ Jesus. We want the easy way. We aren't bold enough to stand up and speak truth to power. We've become weakened by our own lust and love for the things in this sick world. Hmm. As I said, as I read in our, the opening scripture, it talks about the, how good the word is for our lives, for rebuking, for correcting, for instruction in righteousness. And then it says what it does is it, it proves, it equips you the word of god equips the man of god and yet we want it to be what we want it to be in other words we strip the word of god which makes us ill-equipped we change it to what we want it to be which makes us ineffective in the preaching and the teaching of the gospel it is because of this high priest amaziah that God told Amos in the ninth verse that uh, the high places of Isaac shall be desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. In other words, God is in a way saying that the high priest has failed. As I said before, he ain't doing his job. He's not encouraging the people to do what they need to do. That's what God is saying. God was deliberate. He was very deliberate in his words. In other words, the Lord here is straightforward 
in these words and he is very direct. I don't blame him. This is his house. This is his temple. And this was the man charged to be what? The leader. To lead the people to him. Israel's complete disregard for his law and disrespect of him in worship at this point had gotten to a fever pitch. In other words, it got on his nerves and the Lord was tired. The sanctuaries mean the temple. The place of worship. The Lord is going to tear it down. The temple at Bethel was about to become rubble. Hmm. Amaziah now hearing this decides to let the king know. At the same time, mock the man of God. Make him seem less than what he was. See, when sinful men hear the truth, they have no defense. As I said before, instead they turn to mocking and name calling to show their superiority when in reality they have no power. But they forget that God is the judge and will carry out his righteous judgment on them. And then not only on them, but the Lord will carry out his righteous judgment on anyone that listens and follows. False teachers of our time now and those who follow them better beware. You look, we, we look at the generations of people who have followed false teachers that have been around for, for, for hundreds of years. We look at after the second great awakening, how these false uh, notions out of the Mormon church and out of uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they have all these people for all these years, for over a hundred years, have followed this false teaching and have died in this and now are being judged by God. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die once and after what death becomes what? The judgment. These people and the people that started this have been judged. Jesus said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name. I, I healed the sick. I, I, I cast out demons in your name. I did all these things for your purpose. And the Lord is going to say, I do not know you. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. We must understand that not only is God going to get the false teacher themselves, but the Lord is going to get you who listen. The word of God is not abstract. The word of God is straightforward. There is no ambiguity. There is no gray area. There is no purgatory. There is heaven and hell. And if you are not in the word of God, if you are not teaching it, you will lift your eyes in hell. This is the, the reality of the word of God. Yes, these are, these are tough sayings like Amaziah is doing here in this text. These are tough sayings, but they need to be said. We need to stop sugarcoating the gospel and start preaching the hard truth. Living for God is not easy. That's why Jesus said, anyone that follows me must first deny himself. Why did Jesus say that? Well, Jesus said that because he himself had to deny glory. He had to give up glory in order to come here. To make the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. And then be arisen and go back to his home in heaven. We as God's people must understand that denying ourselves means what? Sacrifice. As Jesus was the perfect example of that. We must follow him. This life is not easy. This, this life. It's like a bed of roses, beautiful at times, but thorny at others. You can't have the rose without the thorns. You can't have this life without bad situations. You will go through trials. You will go through tribulations. That is a part of being a part of Christ. When we take up our cross and follow him, we must understand that we're going to have to go through things. This is the truth that we must preach. So Amaziah tells Amos in verse 12 and 13 to go back to Judah. 
and prophesy there. In other words, get out. You know, you're not welcome here. Amaziah's words to Amos revealed the wicked attitude in the priest's heart. He was encroaching on his territory. At least that's what Amaziah was thinking. He was trying to take his position away. He's trying to get up here and get and get influence. And that way, Amos didn't care nothing about it. But yet, the high priest's arrogance, instead of listening, he put on the noise canceling headphones spiritually and refused to listen to what Amos was saying. See, Amaziah's words show his arrogance and disdain for the man of God and the truth. He tells him that his words will not be heard or adhered to in Israel. Listen to this. He said, your words ain't going to be heard and we will not follow them. Hmm? The truth, they will not follow the truth. He made sure to emphasize that Bethel and the temple belonged to the king and that he was not welcome. In other words, God was not welcome. We ain't following the truth. You ain't welcome. Get out. We're going to do what we want when we want. This is what's happening right now. If you preach that homosexual homosexuality is wrong, you will be canceled. That's, that's, that is how it is. Churches are refusing to say it because they're scared of being canceled. That's sad. Because that's not, Christ cared nothing about what people can do to him. What he cared about is that the truth was spoken. Which is what we need to worry about. We're, we're scared to speak against the mess that is being taught our children. We're scared to speak the truth that our children are being exposed to things that are not of God. Young people coming in pregnant when they ain't married. Hmm? Young boys coming in and all these crazy outfits, pants hanging off the rear end, all this mess going on and nobody in the church is saying things because we don't want to offend. Well, if you don't want to offend, then you shouldn't be preaching. Because the word of God offends, it's supposed to. The Bible says it is a two-edged sword. It's going to cut you because it's going it's to hurt. Because the truth is going to hurt. But the thing is, is that the purpose is that it gets your attention so that you can change. The word can change your heart. It can cut you, but it will change your heart if you allow it to do so. So God wasn't welcome in the temple anymore up there. The truth was not welcomed at all. He tells Amos, go back home, buddy. Work on your farm. Earn your living. Amaziah truly shows his arrogance and stupidity toward the man of God, unknowingly mocking the Lord God himself. How was Amaziah mocking the Lord and the preacher? Well, he claimed in verse 13 that the temple belonged to the king. That verse says, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. So basically God was, was evicted and the king took over. The worship was taken over. What am I saying here? What I'm saying here is that the church don't belong to nobody but God. It is his house and he is the one who maintains it. This is why God said the high places shall be destroyed. The high places shall be destroyed. These churches better watch out. We wonder why churches are falling, why they're dissolving. It's because they disinvited the Lord in. Why pastors are falling? Because they refuse to preach the truth. Why all these pastors are getting busted for all of these evil things and getting busted for embezzling because they were not there for the right reason. Churches are in disarray and turmoil because we have allowed Satan in. We think we're right. But according to the word of God, you're about as wrong as you can be. Verses 14 and 15 says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. No, I wasn't. 
neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Dr. Warren Wearsby explains these verses this way. Now, when we listen to the prophet's message to the priest, first Amos revealed the kind of man he was by not intimidating or being intimidated or running away. Like Nehemiah, he could say, should such a man as I flee, which is what Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 6 and 11. To run away, talking about Amos right now, to run away would be to agree with all the accusations and insinuations the false priest had made. Then Amos told Amaziah what he was, a prophet called by God. In, the, in his native Judah, he did not work as a prophet, but as a herdsman and a tender, tenderer of sycamore trees. He didn't make himself a prophet, nor was he a son of the prophets, that is, a student of one in the prophetic schools. But God called him, and he obeyed the call. God called him and equipped him and said, Go! And Amos obeyed. When I read this, these verses, it reminds me of when I was called. I didn't want it. Lord knows I didn't. I had a plan for myself and my future. But the Lord said, this is your future. The preaching, the teaching, and the baptizing of souls for me. Like Amos, I wasn't looking for the calling. But God in his wisdom had already called me. For Jeremiah 1, 4 through 8 says, then the, Lord, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the room, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and, so, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Hmm. Amos shows here that he was not afraid of Amaziah. Despite the high priest having the ear of the king, he stood boldly and declared God's judgment. He did it with the confidence and power from God. Amos did not falter in his message. How many of us are willing to boldly proclaim the gospel even when it is most dangerous? How many of you are willing to say, for God I live and for God I'll die? Amos' co commitment to his uh, calling, despite the opposition, should be our example. There was a chance that Amos could have been killed by the king, but yet he stood firm. It was a chance that he could have been sniped without knowing where the arrow came from. And yet he stood right there in the midst and preached and prophesied the word of God. Let's look at the contrast of these two men. Dr. Warren Wiersbe shows their contrast this way. Amaziah, he had position, wealth, authority, and reputation. But Amos had the word of God. He was a farmer from Tekoa. Amaziah served the king of Israel and depended on him for support. But Amos served the king of kings and had no fear of what men could do to him. Many times in the history of the church, God has called humble instruments like Amos uh, to declare his word. And we had better prepare to listen and obey it's not the approval of the religious establishment. No. It's not their approval that counts, but the calling and the blessing of the Lord. We, 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 I think the problem with the church is we, we got boards and we got this and we got that. And, you know, they make the decision. No, sorry. You have no authority over God's man. What I mean by that is, is that 
when God has called a man to be pastor and to preach the gospel, you cannot block it. You can't. Because if you do, the Lord's going to give you. Period. Hmm. So when reading these verses and looking at the actions of Amaziah, the question asked should be, who does the high priest Amaziah truly serve? And who does he truly represent? These are questions we must ask of our church leaders today. But sadly, most of them truly serve and only represent themselves and only serve their own interest. And I'm talking about boards, pastors, church leaders as a whole. Not all, but most. They have completely left their first love, just like Amaziah here, in our text. Power, money, notoriety. They feel that if they get those, they can be effective in the ministry or be effective in the community. But what they don't understand is while they're trying to attain those, they're losing the community. If you're not willing, even when you're small, to go out to preach the gospel and reach those in the community, then you're wasting your time. Because you're trying to build yourself up here, and yet the community is reducing itself. In other words, they're walking away from you, they're refusing to listen, and the community is descending into chaos. Because that's what's happening right now. The word of God is not adequately getting out. Because the church is looking here when we live to be out here. We're not doing our job. Jesus says, go ye therefore into the world. He didn't say stay in the sanctuary. He said, go out, not come in. That's the problem. That's why the church is ineffective, because we have not gone out. We come to church on Sunday morning to a fashion show. But when we leave, nobody goes in the community. Nobody has made an impact in the community whatsoever. Oh, yeah. We'll volunteer and do things for the county. We'll volunteer and do things for the mayor. That ain't helping the community. Helping the community means that the church itself must go out in the community themselves. Not just to City Hall, not just to Congress, but in the homes, in the houses, within the community that the church resides. So that the community can be built up spiritually and then the community will get better physically. That's the mission. That's the calling of Christ to the church. Verses 16 and 7 says, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. Amos then was like, well, you're telling me I can't preach this to the people. I can't say this. I can't say that. So I'm going to say something to you. So this is what I got to say to you. So Amos then proclaimed the word of the Lord to Amaziah and informed him of the judgment, listen, of the judgment that God will send on him and his family. Amaziah will lose all of his property, go into exile, and die far from his native land. The Assyrian soldiers who would come eventually would slay his sons and daughters, and his wife would be left destitute and would become a prostitute. Then finally, the nation of Israel would go into exile and be no more. It would be quite a change from serving as the king's chief religious leader in Bethel. So basically here in these verses, we see that the Lord not only is going to judge the nation, but he's going to judge individually. And right here, the Lord judged the leader, the high priest in the temple harshly. Why would you say that? Preacher, why would you say that, Pastor? Well, I'm saying that because he was he was given the responsibility of guiding the nation, as I said before, in worship to God. He was responsible for teaching the law. 
correcting and rebuking those that refuse to follow the law and get the nation out of the idol worship and focused on God. That was his job and he failed. And so here in these verses, the Lord through Amos said, well, buddy, this is your punishment. Harsh, but rightfully so. When you not when you're not doing what God calls you to do, there is punishment. Plain and simple. Amos, oh sorry, Am Amaziah, excuse me, was a sad representation of who Israel was at that time. A spoiled, wicked, and selfish and rebellious nation. They felt they were in a protected class because God was their protector. They basically put the Lord in a box. God to them was no more than a bellboy or a bellhop. They felt like the credit of inheriting the land went to God, but their wealth, military, and economic progress, they credited to themselves. Then to add insult to injury, they decided that worshiping God wasn't enough. So they brought in other gods and pagan practices. Amos and other prophets at this time had to go against their own people to give them the word of the law. They had to preach and prophesy against their sin and push back on their rejection of God. In this day and time, the church has gotten so politically correct that we are scared of those in power by not preaching the truth. We need to stop trying to appease the political elite or the religious hierarchy because they don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. But God does. We need, we as preachers need to preach against other preachers that ain't doing their job, that are false teachers, that are leading God's people astray. We are called to call them out and to rebuke them. That's what the word of God is there for. To rebuke their sin, to rebuke their mess, and to bring God's people back to righteousness. That is our job. The church today would rather have a most motivational speaker than a true man of God. The church would rather have a name brand false teacher rather than a man of God who seeks knowledge and strength from the word of God. The church today is blinded by secular education instead of being led by the spirit. We, we put so most folk, go to college, go to college, go to college. These kids get go in and get yanked out of the word of God and get yanked in some mess that ain't got nothing to do with the word of God. College ain't the only way to make it. You can make it through trade. I I don't the only apostle in the word of God that actually had an education was Paul. The others were fishermen. But yet they were blessed by the Lord because they did the job that they were called to do. And even Paul said in Philippians, I count everything that I got before Jesus, before I accepted him as rubbish, trash, worthless, because in the end, your degree means nothing in Christ. In the end, the Lord is going to ask, what have you done? Have you preached my word? Have you reached out to the community? Have you brought souls to me? Have you built and added to the kingdom? What will your answer be? Hmm. The church is not being persecuted by the world from the outside so much as they're being poisoned by Satan from the inside. The church has allowed Satan and his false teachers in and they make a mockery of God and his word. They feed the people what they want and motivate them to move far, further and further away from him and his word. Many won't study for themselves and are easily seduced by these false teachers. So Amos, this farmer, who God called to prophecy in Israel, warns God's people of judgment that is to come. He tells them, that they are a crooked wall that does not measure up. He tells them that God is angry and he will start at the top and destroy and take away all that they have gained. I know this judgment may seem harsh, but God had to sit, God had sent many 
prophets, many men that were attacked. Some even lost their life because Israel and Judah refused to turn back to God. So now God is fed up with their mess. God has gotten tired of their sin. God has given plenty of time to repent and change. So now is the time of judgment. We as a people and a nation must repent for judgment is coming down. We have to stop playing church and playing with God and repent. We have to turn back to God and his word. We have to be bold and preach the truth that can give life eternal. Stop worrying about your name. And preach the name of Jesus. Stop worrying about a retirement plan. Because God has given us the ultimate retirement plan. And that is heaven up above. Talking about God's preachers now. We have to give our respect and love to God. For it is he that has made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We have to be bold and preach. We have to be bold and teach the truth. We have to be bold and let the world know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We must be bold and have faith because the Lord is with you as long as you are fulfilling his will. We must stand against darkness and shine the bright light within us. Be bold even if your family leaves. Be bold even when the world is against you. Be bold because the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. Be bold. Stand up and be bold. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, stand up and be bold. Stand up and be bold, and be bold in the face of adversity. Boldness in the face of adversity. Boldness in the face of adversity. God bless you, and may the Lord keep you is our prayer. We have to be bold, and it needs to start in the house of the Lord. If it is out of order. And if it is false. We must say something. We can't be quiet. We've been silent too long. I think I, I think we have become to the point. To where we are silent to a fault. Meaning that we have allowed things to happen in the church. Without opening our mouths. And that's not what God has called us to be. Amos and those prophets of that time preached against their own people. They rebuked their own people. They preached judgment and doom on their own people because they needed to hear the truth. They needed to know that judgment and the punishment was coming for them all. And God chose the men of their very nation to do that. And we as preachers and pastors and leaders, we need to do that. We need to do that to our political realm, which has become such a cesspool to the point to where they don't work for nobody but themselves. And then we must do it in the church because we have splintered ourselves along color lines. We've splintered ourselves along doctrinal lines. We've splintered ourselves for no apparent reason. We all want to go to heaven, but we want to do it on our own terms. And that's not how it works. tired of it. We're so worried about a money grab, we ain't trying to get souls saved. Pastors are more worried about the church fund and the pastor's anniversary than they are about 
the saving of souls. Sorry. But none of neither one of those things, church fund or church pastor's anniversary, none of that messes in the gospel. None of it has nothing to do with Christ. I understand you love and take care. Yeah, that's fine. Celebrate and whatever. But it's not scriptural. What's scriptural is that the gospel must be preached. I'm tired of it all. The gospel must be preached. And if you are not doing the job that God has called you to do, you will be removed. And the Lord is going to yank you. And when he does, you have nobody to blame but yourself. And when the judgment comes, you can't blame nobody but yourself. All those who are not doing the job God has called you to, woe unto you. Do the job that God has called you to. In other words, fulfill the calling that is on your life. And that is true study of the word of God to gain knowledge. You don't study to preach. You study to gain knowledge. Many study to preach. And that's why they're ineffective. But if you study to gain knowledge, you will be effective. Because it's not just about the one time here or the one time there. Anytime, even when you're not preaching, if someone asks you a question, you got to answer because you study to gain knowledge. God bless you. And may the Lord keep you is our prayer. Amen. Boldness. In the face of adversity. I know this sermon is not going to be liked by many. And I don't care. I know this message will not, uh, will be rejected. Possibly get me canceled. I don't care. The gospel has to be preached. The truth has to be preached. I am tired of ineffective preachers. Who are ill-equipped to do the job that God has called them to do. And if they are not called. The Lord will show that as well. I'm tired of it. This world is descending into chaos and we're standing around twiddling our thumbs like idiots, thinking that we're immune, like we're Teflon. No, we're not. The Lord is going to hold us responsible. Responsible, excuse me. Judgment does not start in the world. It starts in the church. Those from the past and those that are present and Lord's willing, those in the future. If I'm you... It's time to get your behind in gear and get in the word of God. And if you are not called, get your behind out of the pulpit and still get your relationship with God fixed. And if you are out and if you are called and you are not doing your job effectively, I suggest you get in the word and learn what you need to do. God bless you. And may the Lord keep you is our prayer. May the Lord keep the church actually all of us as God's people let's keep the church in our prayers pray for our church leaders pray for our pastors man we must and above all we must learn for ourselves in order for us to know the difference we have to study so that we can know what's false and what's true God bless you may the Lord keep you as our prayer I won't keep you long thank you for joining in with us this afternoon uh, remember, uh, you all can uh, watch this again, or uh, if you're not, uh, if you didn't, if you missed us live, you can always catch us on YouTube at Colorblind Fellowship Church on YouTube. This will be posted on YouTube. Also, uh, if you can't catch us there, you can catch us on Rumble.com. Colorblind Fellowship Church on Rumble. Also, please subscribe to both those pages, and uh, anytime a new one comes up, you can click on it, and you will be able to watch. I think you'll have. I don't think you have to join the watch. Just uh, type in Colorblind Fellowship Church. The page should come up. It'll be a lot of pages, but you should be able to click the icon, um, click on it, and it'll come up. But I, I urge you all to join and to uh, subscribe so that uh, the word can be spread to you. And uh, don't be don't be afraid to tell others. And uh, to subscribe, join in, learn from the Word of God. I'm asking you to do this because I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for the Lord. My name don't matter. I, I, I didn't name the page after myself. I wanted to make sure uh, that it wasn't about Reverend Mark Anthony Reed. I want it to be about Christ and who he is. That's why I don't ask for money. That's why I don't ask for favors. All I ask is that you spread the word. 
hear the word and be changed by the word. That's my mission and that's what God will do. And the Lord will give it the increase. And whatever the Lord decides is the increase is what it's going to be. But the bottom line is, is that my job does not change and I will not stop. I know the last few weeks has been rough. I was sick last weekend. I wanted to preach, but I couldn't preach. I had knee problems this week. Other issues, other situations came and the Lord, I said, I, the Lord said, you're going to preach this morning. I said, yes, yes, sir. I am preaching. And the Lord's willing next week, same time, noon, we will be preaching again. Sunday afternoon fellowship will be noon every Sunday from now on. This is the mission, this is my calling, and this is what I'm going to do. Whether it's an old sermon or a new sermon, wherever the Lord leads me, the word shall be preached. So I urge all of you to know that our time is going to be noon every Sunday, and we will be preaching the gospel every Sunday at noon. God bless you, and may the Lord keep you is our prayer. And I urge you all to keep those on the prayer list in your prayers. Uh, Ms. Rosie, we're praying for you. I hope you're watching, or if you're not, if you do watch, just know I'm praying for you. We're praying for you, and that the Lord will heal your body. Amen, amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your message. We thank you for your spirit. Lord God, continue to use me as your instrument. Continue to use me, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I keep me humble is my prayer. Keep me humble. Even in the tough times, even when things kind of out of the blue happen, keep me humble, keep me faithful, and keep me close to you, Lord God. I want to be like David, a man after your heart, Lord God, that becomes better, that learns from adversity, that gets stronger, Lord God, and not to waver from your law, not to waver from your word. Help me to be like Jeremiah, Lord God, to stand up, to stand up. And worship you and to preach you even when everybody else has walked away from you in the name of Jesus help me Lord God to be like Paul to understand that the gospel be that it being preached and taught is important and that it should not be put to the side and that we should not waver please Lord God in the name of Jesus help me to be like Peter to be bold when he stand in front of the Sanhedrin council to be bold like Stephen when he stand before when he stood before the Sanhedrin council Lord God in the name of Jesus Lord God bless the names on the prayer list bless Miss Rosie Lord God bless the, the Shulas bless all those Lord God in the name of Jesus let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord my strength and my redeemer in your name Lord amen God bless you and may the Lord keep you is our prayer. We thank God for all of you joining in and who will join in uh, to hear this word. We pray that you continue to follow us and continue to subscribe. And uh, just know this one thing that I love all of you. And there is nothing you can do about it. Have a blessed week, blessed rest of your day. And we will see you next Sunday, same time, same place. Sunday after afternoon fellowship at noon. God bless you.